Next up, uh, the panel was a favorite from last year, and this year we've got a great group on community-based brands with TSH, Ah Fallen, and Fun Mof, moderated by the wonderful Carrie Finch from Future Factor. Uh, but first, let's watch this piece by 21st Century Brand as a conversation starter. Hello, on brands. Uh, we are 21st Century Brand and we are honoured and grateful to be given the platform to talk about uh, an, an issue which we think is critical to the future of kind of, of, of commerce here, here in Europe and, and around the globe. My name is Neil, I am the co-founder and CEO of 21st Century Brand. And I am Isaiah, I'm an anthropologist and strategist at 21st Century Brand. Okay, one minute on us before we get into this topic and set up this amazing panel you're going to see. So. Uh, our mission is to create the most influential brands of our time. We formed inside Airbnb and um, where Isaiah and I crossed paths and we really saw a lot about how brands can be a force for good, albeit slightly polarizing ones at times, and really drive a lot of value in the world and a lot of value for different communities. And, and, and the company really has been founded to work with those sorts of companies. We think there's gonna be 150 of those probably around the world. We wanna work with them, as many of those as possible. And you can see there some of the ones we're working with to date across the world in Europe. And we're very proud and humbled to be working with them. How we really help equip brands to grow is on these four pillars of excellence, which we think create 21st century brands, uh, being purpose-led, community-driven, tech-enabled, and, and having a really strong narrative base to tell that story everywhere. And today's really about that community-driven pillar and, and how, how brands can not just meet consumer needs, which is sort of the traditional brand building model, but actually galvanize kind of community participation and creativity through creating really good mutual value incentives and, and, and mechanisms so that, so that the sort of flywheel going on. And that area, community driven brand building is a huge area of, of sort of hype, of energy right now in the world. And, and there's good reason for that because done right, it creates this exponential value um, for, for product, for marketing, and also operational efficiencies because they, they become a really a part of the brand's um, sort of growth mechanism. And, um, and notable examples, you know, one is, is Glossier, you, you know, it's a, a killer millennial uh, driven um, makeup um, beauty company, which, which really, you know, it's community forums, it's platforms, it's blogs and so on. They really drive a lot of the NPD and a lot of the research and stuff that goes on. It's just happening there naturally. And a lot of the evangelism comes from that community as well, rather than having to rely on advertising. And they're already, at, I think, one and a half billion after six years in existence. Um, Peloton, maybe even more powerfully, um, you know, eight years in, created a really unique community-driven uh, connected fitness model. The instructors are these amazing sort of celebrities in their own right, Pete, that they, that they're, they're, the fitness community loves them. And those instructors share in that value and they're advocates for the brand. Everything reinforces itself. So there's a, you know, a lot of value can be created when it's done right. But on the other hand, more often than not, value creation often excludes the communities that these platforms are built on. Let's look at a couple of examples. So take Spotify, for example, currently worth over approximately 50 billion euros, yet more than 80% of their artists earn under 230 euros annually. Which kind of begs the question, when does community service become community exploitation? Some of this frustration is creating a new space for artist-owned music platforms, such as Ampled and Doors Live to operate a more equitable, ethical and transparent music distribution platform. Similarly, DoorDash, the leading food delivery service in the US, damaged its brand reputation when news broke that driver tips were not passed on to the actual drivers. And the same is happening in Europe. Delivery's treatment of its drivers has a negative impact on uh, its investor relations, had a negative impact on its IPO performance, and continues to spark driver protests demanding more fair treatment. On the other hand, community-driven brands recognize and action the need for more community accountability. They iterate and co-design with their community to ensure that empowerment initiatives have a genuine mutual benefit. So, how, so our challenge today for, for all of us uh, at on, the on-brand community is how do we, individuals and initiatives come and go, there's been lots of great stuff things happening, but how do we actually ensure systematically the companies are set up to succeed here. It's not that Spotify, there's a lot of great people there, there's amazing things happening, but there's, we think there's more mechanisms needed, more structures needed to ensure that the community's interest are genuinely built in to the way that they drive growth. So we've got three things to, to talk about for the rest of our five, I think five minutes we've got left. One is about leadership and, and how we embed it there. One is about board and representation and how it's, and how it's embedded there. And then one is about ownership. 
Awesome. So let's kick off with leadership. What does that mean? It means establishing and incentivizing leadership accountability for community well-being. So your community needs to have a voice in the C-suite. Someone in the executive leadership team needs to be accountable to the community. This can look like multiple things, but we think it can also look like appointing a chief community officer, someone who sets community-focused KPIs, which are tied to the role's performance. Miles Hopper, the founder and chief community officer at Mindful Chef, is a strong example of this in action. And that creates great positive tension. You know, a lot of companies grow very, you know, there's a lot of tension, positive tension, which, which creates good conflict, which, and, and, you know, having someone really incentivized at sea level with well-being at the heart and, and meaningful measures there, we think can be incredibly powerful. Secondly, we have representation. We need to represent and advocate for community interests at board level. For some platforms, community representation can look like having a member of your community, depending on the business, for example, a driver, a host, a guest as a member of your board. For other platforms, in the case of Reddit, community representation can look like appointing a specific member of an unrepresented community who may be better placed to advocate for and implement certain business decisions that serve community members. And lastly, we have ownership. Brands need to commit to a minimum community ownership structure that ensures communities share in the value they help to create. An example here is Gorillas. Berlin-based on-delivery startup um, that just is one of the fastest European unicorns. Unlike other gig economy companies, Gorillas employs more than 1,000 riders directly and has pledged that its warehouse and rider crew will get a share of $1 million in equity. So that is, a, that's a, you know, that's a provocation for, for us all. How, how do we do this? How do we make it more systematic? more enduring and ultimately you know creatives marketers entrepreneurs everyone here uh, on listening to this you, you know you you guys you love constraints that's how you create magic you know that are so many of the best um, ideas the best platforms of the last 15 years have been about embracing those constraints and so our plea is you know embrace the community well-being constraint at the heart of your business models at the heart of your platforms at the heart of your marketing and we know if you do that meaningfully You'll, you'll, you'll create more magic and it will, the, the value will be spread around a bit more evenly. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Neil Barry and Isaiah Wellington Lynn there, both from 21st Century Brand. We'll be coming back to some of the points that they've been making through our session. And good day, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. It's fabulous to be back on the On Brand stage. My name is Kerry Finch. I'm the founding partner at Future Factor. And we help uh, conscious brands, creative businesses, and tech innovators shape and sustain a leadership position. Now, today we are joined uh, on stage by three community-driven brands. We have with us today Caroline Marshall-Don, who is Head of Communication at Van Mulf. Uh, Stephanie Jordan is the co-founder of Avalon Spirits. And with us also, we're joined by Charlie McGregor, who is the founder and CEO at the Student Hotel. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's great to be out. Um, let's talk about community. Um, if I can come to you first, Charlie, I mean, all three of your brands, of course, community is at the center and always has been since the get-go. And Charlie, your, your communities are, are multiple. You have multiple ecosystems. The name is the Student Hotel, but you're juggling all sorts of communities. Tell us a bit about that and how that works and why it's important to you. Yeah, thank you. Nice, nice to be here with everyone, uh, indeed. Um, yeah, for us, we have, uh, of course, the Student Hotel TSH, we have a very strong student community, uh, but the name doesn't really do us justice. We have a, a very vibrant co-working community, which really connects to the local fabric of the city with the entrepreneurs and the startups and also the corporates. We have a co-living product, and we have, of course, the hotel transient yeah. guests. From very early on, we saw that the secret of our success was the mixing of these communities. Um, you know, students traditionally had quite a bit bad reputation. They would destroy the place. You know, what we discovered by mixing different demographics and different profiles, then, then everybody's behavior kind of levels out and it becomes much more 
like what we experience in the Starbucks or on the Metro, and that's where we feel much more comfortable. So, so we have a fixed community of the people who stay there for, 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 for a year to live, or they stay there for a workplace to work all the time. And the transient guests pick up on this energy that's left behind, this relaxed sort of magic sauce that's, that's left behind by the community, and that's why they like to, to, to come and play with us. So, so mixing it up, I think, is... Uh, Key for us. Makes it more natural. Yeah. And I know that the Student Hotel was one of the early adopters of Van Moof bikes back in the day. Caroline, why is community important and central to Van Moof uh, from city to city? Um, yeah, hi. Nice to be here. Um, I think it must be because we make bikes for people. Um, and it's how Vamov started long before I joined. Uh, just two brothers had the idea to redesign a bike, make it better, make it possible for people to cycle, just like we do in Amsterdam, everywhere in the world. And their first hundred or so bikes, they just gave away mm -hmm. to friends, family, people in the city uh, to get direct feedback. Now we would call it fancy word rapid prototyping. Um, but it's yeah how they started out, and we still do it to this day, be it in a different form, uh, getting direct feedback from our riders how and where to improve. So it's 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 adapting, 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 and evolving yeah. the community. Yeah, as we go and before you're finished. Fantastic, um, Stephanie. When it comes to Avalon Spirits, and I do love a tipple, uh, you know that. Um, <laughs> We are looking at different types of community, and the brand is really driven by those communities, be it farmers, be it the bees. Talk us through why that is for Avalon. I think what's incredibly exciting about having created um, and, and, and the moment we're in of growing Avalon is actually these communities are evolving and changing. Mm -hmm. We wanted to create a drinks brand that would give back more, more than it took. We wanted to create something that would have positive impact on the environment. We wanted to create a drinks brand that would challenge the concept of profit amongst other things. And so we started with this be positive and basically um, contributing a financial amount back to the pollinators, the wild bees that are responsible for every single apple blossom, which becomes a delicious crisp apple that goes into our so brandy. Delicious. Um, but simultaneously, as we go on the journey, the community that we actually engage with the most, not as a brand, but as the founders of the brand, is actually the drinks industry, the broader industry, um, whereby 90% of all drinks brands consumed actually belong to 10 global companies. We're trying to challenge that and educate and elevate the conversation on sustainability. And so for me, the community that I engage with the most is the industry that um, I've come from and I continue to be a part of. And that you're changing basically from the inside by utilizing what you know already. Correct. Avalon is and sort again, of the, the poster child for how we can be more and how we can create an ecosystem around sustainable drinking. Fantastic. So let's let's pu pull uh, a few threads from what Neil and Isaiah were talking about, which was leadership, ownership, representation. Charlie, if I can come to you first, let's think about representation. Um, and how does the student hotel continue to stay connected and, and be responsive uh, to its communities, you know, at the very top of the organization, yeah. now that you're growing, you're expanding in more and more cities around the world? Yeah, it was nice to see the presentation. I mean, we have a, a chief of a community who reports directly into the executive board, mm -hmm. uh, is an integral management position as part of our, 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 our commerce and, and operations team. So really at the heart of the operations team and with a direct line in, in, into me, actually. Um, so, you know, we take it really seriously. Uh, as part of our whole community, of course, we, we focus on the students when they arrive, you know, that whole onboarding, are they okay? Do they know where they're coming? Are they, do they feel happy, safe, etc.? And of course, during COVID, that was pretty intense, uh, making sure the whole community was safe and, and okay. But we, we have uh, representatives within the community that speak for the community. We have dedicated members of uh, staff who spend time with them, you know, the kitchen buddy sort of, uh, uh, terminology, um, you know, coming out of that where we're now employing students to be our, our, our um, uh, summer sales uh, team, mm -hmm. they are students that lived with us and they are helping us um, make bookings for the next wave of students coming in. So they're giving tours to moms and dads, they're, they're, they're telling the students what's going on. And in fact, we, we, we normally, you know, take quite a lot of those people onto our team because they're, they're just rock stars. So, you know, we, we have a very good connection there. On the co-working team, 
uh, and, and the community there, you have a different type of relationship, you know, because they're, they're, they're professionals, they're looking for, for certain things, they know what they want in terms of how to get by on a day-to-day -day basis, and they know the local area, but they're looking for how do I give back? You know, how do I get in contact with the student community because I want to help people with their thesis, but I'm also looking for interns, I'm also looking for that knowledge, knowledge sharing. So there's different, you know, coming back to what you said, we have different communities, so we have to service them differently, but we have one community team, and right. we are really making sure, and our USP is that, you know, the, the student spirit is, is alive in a lot of our, our co-workers, you know, a lot of those companies. So, so we make sure that that sort of mentality is the, is, the, is the red thread that connects people, the curious, the unfinished, the, the open mm -hmm. part of, uh, of, of our personalities. That's our, that's our sort of customer target. And we just make sure that all the facilities, all the events are designed to, to connect people together and, and just, you know, harder in COVID times, of course. But yeah, um, but yeah that's, that's, that's what we do. Um, Caroline, if I can uh, move on to you and think about ownership. So I know that Van Molf gave the, op gave, uh, the original community uh, from Van Molf an opportunity to have co-ownership. Oh, yeah. How did that work? Why did Van Molf do it? What does it mean to the company? Yeah, um, yeah I think back to that point of, oh, we grew because of our riders. Um, at the moment that we were uh, open for funding, because um, that's what you need to grow and grow faster. Uh, T. Sintaco, um, the founders, they thought, oh, we must open up to our community. So we even started with crowdfunding first. We did it in 2017 and then again in 2019. We got, like in Holland, the, the max is two and a half million. That took us only 14 days uh, in 2017, but we got that in 12 hours wow. in 2019. And Congratulations. the thinking That's is like you can share in uh, much like one of the examples from the video, you can yeah. share the gorillas example, Yeah, uh, share sure. in the profit. And Stephanie, uh, Avalon's done something similar, is that right? So we did an equity crowdfund at the end of last year. Um, same, same concept, ultimately we were opening up not to our end drinkers, not, not to the citizens, but actually to our drink industry peers. Mm -hmm. So um, friends that we've known throughout our careers, bartenders especially, you know, the people that are able to make the decision to influence your, your purchase decision at the bar and for as little as £10 for a share. Um, and so we got 380 people that came on board. It was a small fundraise. We're still a startup, um, but we did £250,000. And that was, uh, it was amazing. And now 10% of the company belongs to what we call the hive. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. The bees. <laughs> it's all about the bees. Um, so Neil and Isaiah uh, spoke about these three things, responsibility, ownership, leadership. Um, but at Avalon, you've got another way of staying authentic. Is that right? It's about the tech? Tell us yeah, about that. Yeah, I feel that, that um, my, my business partner, Tim, he's a, he's a, he's a tech geek. And um, the way he described to me that we should build the company was almost like if we're in Silicon Valley and it was an app, he said, we would never be finished. Mm -hmm. And so we can't get to this perfect stage before we see the day of light. We've got to get out as of when we can, and then we just got to keep evolving and, and upgrading ultimately. Um, but with that, working with tech companies like blockchain that allow us to show entire transparency of supply chain is really, really crucial. Um, our industry, <laughs> and Charlie will know this, um, working in hospitality, we're full of stories. We, we love the stories. And those stories um, change because, you know, history is told in a bar. And in the bar, people are imbibing. So you never really know the truth. And so by having that authenticity of uh, transparency in supply chain and making sure that that information is verified by a third party. So we are made of nothing but apples, water and time. Now you don't have to take my word for it. I have a lab analysis online for everybody to see. And it's that sort of commitment, I think, to the end drinker that's really, really important in yeah. this day and age. Yeah, it's clear authenticity. Yeah, and that speaks, speaks so much truth. Let's think about growth. Uh, obviously, it's very important to all three of you when it comes to developing your brand. Um, what role does the community play, Charlie, in, 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 in how you grow? How do you stay connected to your community? How does it continue to be an ally? Yeah, good question. I mean, what, what, I, what I love and I hate about our community is um, they, you know, the core of our community stay the same age. So every September, you know, they, you get a new batch of students in and every year you get older. So I guess it's quite confronting, but, you know, so every year we have to adapt and every year, you know, we, we focus on that. Come with us, stay for the first year, you know, um, 
and you be, meet the best friends of the rest of your life and then you take a stepping stone away. The, the co-working and the professional community are, are for a lot longer, they're local, local businesses, mm -hmm. etc. But we, we have to adapt all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've grown from uh, the first hotel in 2012 to having 30 hotels today. So we've been, we've been pretty busy growing and building hotels. Where we're now at is we're realizing that the first you know, community of 2012 are really interesting for us today. Um, and I guess the, 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 the way is how do we harness that? How do we still, have we got things that are genuinely interesting for those students that were staying with us 10 years later? You know, are they interested in being co-workers today? Are they interested in letting us know where they've been? What did they learn when they were with us? And so I think trying to connect with them and trying to stay in touch with them is something you have to be you have to be really genuine about it. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, I've got these students and I'll send them a marketing campaign. You know, that's, that's, that's totally the wrong way. It needs to be something that they have to really think, hey, I want to be part of this community still. Um, and that's why I'm going to going to going to keep keep connected to you. So how do you do that? I don't know. But uh, I do know. But it's, 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 it's something you have to to change every single year. Yeah. OK, so you're ever evolving always yeah that keeps you really on your toes yeah. as a brand doesn't it um caroline how does that work for van molf how do you keep your communities on side as allies mm, yeah uh, a very important one especially when you mess up we will hear it there are all these places online that we listen to where Vomo Friders come together. There's like spontaneous Facebook groups and Reddit threads and Discord areas that people are... People like to talk. Yeah, and you get a lot of uh, support when you do good stuff, but when you're missing the mark, you also hear it. So it's very important we've yeah. learned um, to keep an eye out for what the feedback is there. And um, uh, in the past year, we've... Um, went into these Facebook groups, so now it's clear, like, oh, there's Carline from Vomov, so people can directly ask questions or get answers uh, to stuff or get help when they need it. Um, and to that point of uh, have a voice on the, on, in the C-suite, um, we also are playing around with ways to do that uh, in the past year, and we just put um, Taco and Tisa in front of the camera and did, like, open um, Instagram live sessions where you could ask them anything. Um, and, that and that's a brave thing to do, of course. It was scary. Yeah. It was scary, but they did a great job, and we're going to do more of it. And we're even doing it with other people throughout the company, so you can ask directly uh, questions to the designer uh, or hear about how we're scaling up production or whatever topic you're interested if, in. If, if I may, because I think it's scary the first time. But if, and we did that as well, you know, we made mistakes on Wi-Fi speed, whatever, and we tried to sort of ignore a couple of groups that were, 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 were not so happy with us. And, yeah. and then you're, you're on a back foot. You really are trying to, and then, and then when you're trying to get into their Facebook groups, they're like, we don't want you to be part of our group because we're complaining about you. And you have to really build that trust back up. But once you've, once you've reset that, then you're part of that community and you're, you're an, a, a welcomed part of that community and, and being able to play the host role. So yeah. it, does, it does get, it does get a easier once, you, once you've made that first... Uh, yeah, but it still is scary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Steph, for Avalon, how does that work for you? How, does, how do the, your communities and your allies um, drive your growth strategy? I would say that, sort of to both your points, there's something around feedback being a gift. Yeah. And it's, it is very scary. What I found very scary was also this concept of, you know, carte blanche. This is what we do, this is our fundraise document, this is the transparency of our P&L, this is our recipe, you know, these are all our suppliers that we work with. And giving that to the world is a scary thing. And then you realize that actually, if anyone ever did copy you anyway, it's the best form of flattery. Yeah. And because of our purpose, our mission to drive this positive change, actually, I'd rather more people were doing it. Mm -hmm. And so by having that energy, from our side, what we also receive is, is the same type of transparency. So Hive members will send us emails at times and go, guys, uh, saw an Instagram post. You know what? Don't think it was your right tone of voice. Just want to, were you in the good mood when you wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> and then one of us will go, do you know what? No, I was in a really bad mood that day. That's Thanks funny. for picking up on it. Because right. to this day, you know, we're that close to the business that our mood may affect the content that we put out there. Absolutely. So they're there to monitor and to help us, and I think that's really, really powerful. I think that you're all making really interesting points about feedback and uh, uh, about listening, 
basically. Are there times where things have gone wrong where you haven't listened? Are there any key examples that you've really learned from? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, we've been doing this for a while and... Um, and Nothing's we, ever gone wrong, Charlie, right? <laughs> well, you know, there's been a couple of buildings that were delivered not on time, and then you're, you know, the 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 the, the, the community's, you know, living and working in a building site. So, you know, the, whether the Wi-Fi is not working or the the facade is still being built, you know, you're, you. So, so there's been moments, you know, when the community and and the community all know each other. I mean, the, the you know, the the great thing is the community all know things. The, they are connected. The, the bad news is they all know each other. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we we struggle also in you know silly things if we want to to fill a building up or fill a, fill a co-working up and we run a campaign at 100 euros, whatever, and we discount the last few, 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 few chairs to, to fill them up, then suddenly all the community know that those last few chairs were at 90 euros and they all want to be part of that. So, so it really brings uh, different questions into everything you're doing and how the community are going to react and how you, how you justify it and how you can explain it. Because if they do stand up against you, then, you know, you've got a lot of them against you. So keep you on your toes. How, how do you help your communities tell those positive stories? How do you activate your fans? Caroline, how does Van Moof do that? Yeah, um, we don't do that in an, um, like a preconceived way. The focus is on just doing it right. I think that's uh, already... Um, a, a challenge in itself, um, especially if you look at the bike industry now and the long lead times in some areas. So we just try to do it right. Um, and then hopefully when you make a great bike and deliver on time and the experience is fantastic, people start talking about it and, and share it and you win back that trust or that uh, sentiment. Um, yeah, we haven't done like active campaigns around it yet. I just, I think we just saw, oh yeah, we just have to make sure everything's like brilliant, basic level, right? And Steph, what about Avalon? Are there ways that you're activating your, your fans, your consumers, your followers? Yeah, I think what comes to mind of that question is ultimately this concept of letting go of control, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you'll all understand is really, really hard when it's your life savings and it's your baby and actually it's your financial prosperity as well. And so mm -hmm. there's so many emotions tied into having a startup and, and launching your own company. But when I came to understand that actually there was something about organic growth and giving up equity and others having skin in the game and people having opinions, but not just opinions, bringing you know, their magic to it and allowing for them to take it and run with it and, and have a vision for it, that is where I think the real magic has started to happen and that's how people feel involved when at the end of the day you surround yourself with brilliant experts and say, you, you tell me, mm. I don't want to tell you, mm. you know? Um, and that, that I think has been really, really special. And what about um, how, so for example, one of your communities is very uh, deliberately the drinks industry itself. How do you influence the influencers? How do you go about that? That's a big you know, task. It's, 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 it's quite something, it's something quite fundamental to take on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Tim and I, over the course of lockdown, found ourselves really frustrated. Hospitality was closed. Um, our industry was, was massively affected. And um, we were just really twiddling our thumbs and, and didn't know how to engage or connect. And so we ended up creating a series called the Positively Charged Series, which is basically an open and free resource to ignite the sustainability conversations within the world of drinks. And so again, it's about bringing in a bunch of other experts um, and starting to collate knowledge, experience, expertise, and then give that um, kind of broader advice. And it's, it's, I think just creating a forum of collaboration has really been the key. And what about giving back to your communities? Are there ways that you do that? Are there initiatives, for example, this that, that Van Moel for TSH that you've got involved with, either directly or sort of transcendentally? Yeah, I think for us, it's, it's about finding those stories um, and then seeing what we can do to, to accelerate those stories. You know, we have uh, students that have been so inspired with the group of people they've met uh, and this particular student from, from Korea where there was a massive suicide problem and, and his mother actually was, was affected by this. So he was so inspired by the community, he said, I'm going to go back there and I'm going to cheer everybody up and tell them that they should stop, uh, stop uh, topping themselves. So we were like, this is fantastic, you know, let's, let's help you. How can we help you achieve that's your big, goal? That's a big um, deal. You know, and it, we, have, we just found out, we didn't know to us, but uh, some, some two students from Groningen 
uh, picked the, the Van Moof Student Hotel bikes, and he decided to cycle all around the Dutch hotels to raise money for a charity for them. So we've just discovered this. So if you want to do I some, love this some time. marketing uh, together, this is great. <laughs> we I have a story to uh, together. Yeah, but that, I think that's it for us: is finding the stories and seeing what role we can do to help help our community further their, their goals and purposes. And how do you folks involve the underserved, the underrepresented? How, you, how do you bring in you know, the, 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 those folks out there who um, don't necessarily always have a voice? Is, are, are you busy with that? Is that something that's, that you're focused on? Yeah, it, it is a big challenge. And, and you know, I guess we have sort of a campus type feel and you know if you if you go to america and you have a campus type feel then i get a little bit of you know scared of that type of you have to join the community and you have to do this and and here in europe we're much more relaxed about that and i, I embrace that so we try to make sure that the events are all inclusive we try to really um, curate the events so they're 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 not they're they're, they're really across the broad spectrum of, of topics um, but it is difficult you know we also have um, groups of people who just come in, they do their work and they leave again. You know, they don't want to be part of any community. And, and I think that's obviously something that we embrace, we accept. We, you know, it's totally uh, everybody can do whatever they want, you know. So I think it is a balance of trying to find not everybody is like, yeah, I want to be part of the community and happy days and uh, I'm happy to post all my good stories. And, you know, some people are like, I'm never going to sign up to anything. I'm just going to do my thing. And yeah, that's also uh, that's okay. totally fine, yeah. And at Van Mof, how do you how do you see the underserved or the underrepresented? How do you embrace that, that, those folks? Yeah, it's very interesting, um, especially in light of like recent e-bike boom, all these um, bike lanes popping up in cities everywhere, and yeah, the cities are the the places that we focus on, mm. um, and our growing awareness. There's more and more, um, uh, I think. Uh, people talking and writing about how the, the, bike room, the bike boom is fantastic, all this improved bike infrastructure, but it's servicing very privileged areas of cities first. Um, and Amsterdam happens to be an example, or in Holland, an example where uh, e-bike or bike infrastructure is pretty democratic, so it's connecting all parts of our, our cities and our country. Uh, but that's not the case in a lot of other cities in the world, so that might be next frontier for us um, to maybe use our influence or uh, reach or power as a brand to make sure that we open up cities and bike infrastructure or micromobility infrastructure for everyone in a city and not just uh, a lucky few. We touched on truth, we touched on authenticity, and we also touched on those moments where perhaps, you know, the community hasn't been brought alongside and you know they, they've got complaints people aren't always 100 percent happy how do how do you deal with that you know because that's the you know we there are companies there are brands out there who are greenwashing these days who are using communities and not in an authentic manner what would your advice be how do we prevent that uh, you know what's your opinion on 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 that as a as a problem Steph? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's interesting because ultimately we all have the power to drive really tangible change mm. um, at all levels of society, but especially with our consumer purchases. So I think um, it's just reminding each and every one of us that, that when we do make these purchases and we are voting for the planet or not, or, you know, brands that support communities authentically and have um, acc accreditation to back it, things like B Corp, obviously incredibly powerful, 1% for the planet. There's, there's a heap of certification today, which, you know, there's been debate to some of them in the past, but really we need to start to find these guiding stars mm -hmm. that help us make better decisions because at the end of the day, I'm, if time is money and we then use that money and invest it back into those that aren't doing good, we're continuing to, to create the cycle, right? So I just think it's that we all feel inspired and empowered, that we all have the power to change things and to be the change we want to see in the world. And with Van Moof, what would your yeah. advice be? Um, yeah, I think if I look at us, we try to get people out of four wheels and on to two, um, that hopefully makes a little bit of a difference. But it's uh, the same, you're talking about B Corp certifications for us as a company to always look at, okay, where can we improve? 
um, and yeah, commit to always changing, always uh, doing the most sustainable, uh, making the most sustainable choices. I think that's yeah, just like the point earlier. As a as a, um, a tech brand, you're never done. I think on this topic, you should never feel like you're done or that you have arrived. Um, yeah, and keep yeah, keep working. Keep working. Keep taking risks. Are there any times where you've taken risks as brands and it's really paid off, or indeed otherwise? But let's talk about the good stuff. Um, Charlie, well, what about that? What about risk taking when it comes to uh, uh, building TSH? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we as a brand, one of our one of our you know uh, adjectives that describe us is, is, is unfinished, and mm -hmm. you know we've added. Uh, the co-living part was something we hadn't anticipated. Uh, we started getting people from from Nike who were working, you know, three months in Amsterdam, and can we rent a room? So we said, oh, great, let's 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 see if that works. And that's 30% of our business. We uh, we looked, what should we do with some space that we had in one of our hotels? And we thought, well, why don't we try co-working? You know, so we set up our own co-working yes. uh, space, and that's now 20% of our business. So, you know, we've 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 had the always that entrepreneurial spirit to to try and do things we've and i guess we've listened to our community we've listened to what they like to do what do they want to do we've sat and watched them we've we've spent you know weeks and months literally sitting in a community just watching what they do with space uh, now of course you've got prop tech to tell you that this seat's popular and this one's not popular and all that stuff so fantastic but you know it it really is about listening to what they want. It is about trusting your gut feeling as well. What is the next step? Because sometimes people don't know what they want until, until you give it to them. Um, but I think you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time getting feedback uh, and we change. We, you know, we really try to commit to change those top three dissatisfiers across the board. And, and sometimes on a business point of view, that comes to a really difficult moment. You know? yeah. you, sometimes it's impossible to change some of those dissatisfiers. So you need to see what can you do, how can you communicate the reason why behind it. And, uh, but it's working and being honest and, and also being true, true to yourself is, 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 is what they feel. I mean, if the community feel that you're being true to yourself and true to the brand, then people will really want to be part of you, I think. And Avalon, how, do, how, does, how has it worked for you, Steph? The risk taking. In terms of risk taking? I'd say the most recent shift um, has been from kind of being this lovely French Normandy orchard bees, you know, organic -y apple brandy. That's marvelous. Which is great. And then, and again, it's, it's Tim and I together as founders going, God, oh, we just really want to end like global climate change. And <laughs> well, yeah, that's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a jump. Um, but we've come to understand that actually because of our production process, we are climate positive with every bottle we make. Yeah. We actively do reduce global climate change because apple grows on trees and trees sequestrate carbon. And so the ability to have proven that now, it, 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 we've taken the risk and we're giving ourselves the permission to be a brand with a call to action. And that call to action is very clear. It's, you know, please enjoy a delicious tipple. Just don't give the planet a hangover. Yeah. Mm. Now, don't mind if we all have one, <laughs> but it's that kind of, and conscious consumerism, it's just, it's a contradiction, yeah. right? But having that conscious mindset yep. um, <clears throat> and just yeah, allowing ourselves to, to, to go for it and, and to kind of, you know, have that tone of voice for us was a, was a real big shift and uh, let's see if it if it pays off and if people understand we're um, we're super running out of time uh, let's just round up before we go to questions with andrew with um uh what would your tip be with a, a company that wants to be or is community first what's your you must do this tip obviously it's about listening it sounds like it's about taking risks uh caroline what would yours be um, make the scary choices. So make the scary choices. Put your founder in front of a live camera. Make the scary choices. Admit your mistakes. Um, Admit your mistakes is yeah. a really great uh, piece of advice. Yeah. And uh, Stephanie? I think taking risk is great. I also think that focusing on what you're brilliant at is important. Um, when we innovate within the sectors that we're already specialists in, we actually have credibility um, and the authenticity to do it and to do it well. Um, so I think it's actually not being afraid to stay in your lane, yep. but to do that. Play to your strengths. Correct. And Charlie? Yeah, good one. I, I think I'd take a step, step uh, sit on the balcony view, I guess, and, and really say, uh, be authentic and don't try to 
to manufacture a community that's not really there. I mean, yeah. they try, you know, you go on a long haul flight and they say, do you want to be part of the community on the plane? And you're like, this is not a community, you know? So if there's a genuine community there and a genuine need for it, it will harvest itself and then the brand, the, the, the role that we play, we can facilitate it and we can help grow it and we can make part of it. So, you know, be... Don't push your luck. Yeah, and don't go to an agency and say, build me, a, create me a community. You know, it has to be genuine. Has to be genuine, has to be heartfelt. Yep. Folks, thank you so much. Andrew, I know that you have some... Uh, well, I'll just take the last 10 seconds here, if questions. I may. Just give you an observation from the outside. Boom Chicago is also a partner with the Student Hotel yeah. and your sponsors of our comedy festival coming out. And I do have to say is that it doesn't... For me on the outside, it's not just talk. Is even during when we have meetings there, even during pandemic times, people are you know distance and safe. But there is an energy there that people honestly feel, and uh, and our interactions with your people here in Amsterdam is uh, it is you roasted focused. us. They were at our Christmas party, and we got roasted by. <laughs> <laughs> We're still joking about it and still crying about it at the same still time. Still feeling yeah. slightly <laughs> wounded. Well, we feel part of the community there. Uh, so thank you. So yeah. Thank you for that. Nice. Um, I think that's all we have time for. I'll, I'll cool. let you finish up. <laughs> thank you so much, Caroline, Stephanie, and uh, Charlie, and also, of course, Neil and uh, Isaiah. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Mm -hmm.